Well, I guess um, I'd like to begin with just how all of you came to be programming some of the most popular networks in cable, briefly. <laughs> okay, so we could start with Betty. How? Yeah, how did you, you know, come to be what you're doing now? And oh, well, I guess um, rather than spend the whole night on <laughs> all of our resumes, um, I came up through the ranks of on-air promotion and marketing. Uh, I started out in an ad agency, and then I did on-air promotion, oddly enough, for the earliest days of Lifetime, which hmm. was grew out in 1983 out of a merger of a health network and a women's afternoon channel, and I was at the health network. And so uh, it became Lifetime, and I worked there for a little while and then left and um, went to Nickelodeon and then Turner mm -hmm. to launch TNT and then launched the Cartoon Network and then back to Lifetime almost uh, literally 20 years later. <laughs> and um, it's a very different Lifetime, but the, uh, I guess my history really is more, uh, particularly with cable networks, and we're all, you know, we're all from cable, and I know you're going to get into brand things, but cable networks have to think about themselves, always did. Uh, differently from broadcast networks because the moment you're on a, uh, a, a cable box with not four other choices but 60 and then 100 and now today it's probably 300 if you have a digital cable box, you have to define yourself in some way as an idea that's bigger than the sum of your parts or your individual shows because you just just the sheer fragmentation aspect of it. And so I, uh, I think in cable it was very valuable, considered very valuable to understand both on-air promotion, which are the coming attractions and the logos and all that sort of stuff, to then how you market not just individual shows but the entire network. And that tends to often drive what sort of programming you're after because you're thinking about what sort of audience you're after. And so I went from marketing to general management, which is overseeing marketing to programming, to what I'm doing now. But um, you know, in terms of career history, I come some some people will come out of sales, some will come out of programming, and I came out of marketing and promotion. Some come out of uh, law practices, <laughs> uh, which is not exactly the most direct route. I had uh, I was practicing law, getting kind of good at it after 15 years, and um, my now partner at Oxygen, Jerry Laybourne, I was her lawyer in uh, what she told me was going to be a minor contract renewal, where she ended up leaving the uh, running Nickelodeon and going to Disney, which was sort of a big change. Um, and I got hooked on the entertainment business. I had never done anything in entertainment, and I really still wasn't doing anything in entertainment. I was just representing someone negotiating a contract. But I really got excited about it. But Jerry was going off to Disney, and she stayed at Disney for two years, and she called me up one day and said, I want to leave Disney. You have to get me out of my contract. So I did that. Um, and then she called me up in, like, two days before we were about to officially get her out and said to me, I want you to come do this with me. And I said, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm so flattered, but I don't know anything about the cable business. I, I, I really don't. I don't even know what sub is short for. <laughs> and so she said to me, it's short for subscriber and we need a lot of them. <laughs> that was sort of the whole conversation and it seemed like a great thing to do. And when you start what was supposed to be a relatively small business, um, and you're only four of you, you end up doing a lot of things um, from raising all the money we raised to HR stuff to legal stuff that I kind of knew a little bit about and you know start me on affiliate sales and distribution and just one thing led to another and um, lawyers are sort of it's great training for a career because you're you learn basically other people's businesses. That's your job at first. You need to understand their business as well as they understand it so you can represent them and help them navigate uh, through issues. So it was about learning the business and Jerry's a great partner and teacher and that's how I got here. Um, uh, I, I can't say that I took uh, a traditional route um, to being the head of a cable network. I started in film I am one of the very few who spent 10 years very successfully in film in New York and made the choice to move into television. I happened to come straight into the marketing and promotion side as the head of on-air promotion, um, which through a long series of sort of little teeny jobs in between big film jobs was actually a direct fit. I had done both for uh, many years as a producer. So the big change was being an executive at a big company instead of a freelancer.
for my own company. And that was a tremendous choice and a tremendous change. I'm not sure I really knew that it was such a choice when I made it, like most things. And what I would say from, that was about 10 years ago. So it was about 10 years in film, and it's just over 10 years in television now. So every day that, it must be like when you move, and you're like, well, I'm from New York, but 20 years later, everyone in LA thinks you're from LA. Mm -hmm. Everyone in television thinks I'm in television. And I'm like, oh, I work in film, and I just took this job in television. <laughs> so every day that goes, yeah. like literally, it was like a short-term gig. I was like, okay. And um, I would say, more generally, most people will tell you that their career is built on a series of incremental choices presented to them along the way without a real game plan. And that through this series of choices and learning from the choice that you just made and being presented with another one, you get somewhere. So the series of choices I made was to lead me to TV and really very quickly, every couple of years, 18 months to 24 months, I would say I've had a completely new job in television. Five distinct jobs in, in the 10, almost 11 years. Um, I started out on the legal side also. Um, I went moved to Washington thinking I was going into government and um, I clerked for a judge for a year and during that year Ronald Reagan won um, and that ended my government career. <laughs> and so I said I'll go to a big law firm and hide out until the Democrats come back. <laughs> and, <laughs> So I went to a big law firm, and, uh, but it took the Democrats 12 years to come back uh, into office. And by then, um, my career had taken a detour. When I first started at the firm, I was doing oil and gas, which I hated, and then I did a little transportation, which I hated. Uh, and then I found communications, which I loved, and that's how I sort of got into the industry. But I was actually doing FCC regulatory. Uh, law. Um, and then I had a small client uh, called BET, um, and I had been at the firm about uh, five and a half years, and at that point it was either time for me to say, okay, I'm going to want to be partners, I'm going to really buckle down and work hard, or it's time to leave. So I decided it was time to leave because I never really liked the practice of law. Um, so uh, I started looking around and did some interviewing in New York, uh, but long story short, uh, Bob Johnson, the founder of BET, uh, eventually offered me a position as the first attorney at BET, and I started the uh, general counsel's office uh, about 20 years ago. I just had my 20th anniversary at BET. Um, and it was a great time because the company was only five years old. Uh, there were about 80 employees. Um, and, um, you know, we were all learning cable, and there were probably about six or seven executives uh, that reported to Bob, and I was one of them. Um, and in a way, I was the only, uh, what you could call generalist, if you can call a, an attorney a generalist. I mean, there were programming people and advertising sales and affiliate sales, and they, they all had very specialized areas. Uh, but because I was the attorney, I think Lisa said this, I was involved in everything. Uh, whether it was contracts or, you know, for Xerox machines or, or building buildings. We, I, you know, someone said I oversaw the construction of our new, our first production facility. I ran our magazine division. So over time, there were just business things that needed to be done, and I took them on uh, willingly um, because I liked the business side. Uh, so it took me 10 years to get out of the legal side. <laughs> I tried very hard for a very long time. Um, and Bob kept letting me add on things, but never let me really leave. So I was general counsel and publisher and head of strategic business and got to a point where I had so many titles, it was uh, ridiculous. Um, and so then I was offered the position as president and chief operating officer, which actually didn't exist uh, until I was offered the position. So. Uh, that really gave me an overview, and it, it still took me about a year to get my own general counsel and uh, <laughs> convince, convince Bob I couldn't be general counsel and president and COO. So, uh, so that was a really happy day in my life when I got my own general counsel. I actually started sleeping better at night because uh, it was really hard to run a legal department and do these other things because, you know, even though as a general counsel you have to know everything, you don't have to know a lot about everything, you have to know a little bit about everything. 
but when you're doing a lot of other business things, it's really hard to keep up. And I really felt like I was at, at a certain point risking the company's uh, <laughs> legal liabilities because I was involved in too many other things. So, um, so 10 years ago, I became president. And uh, um, Catherine said I became chairman two years ago, but it was only a couple of months ago. Uh, I became CEO in um, November and then became chairman in uh, January. So I never intended to be here. It was a uh, unusual route, and uh, but it really worked out. And uh, having a legal background helps, even though it, it took me a while to stop thinking like a lawyer and start trying to think like a business person. Um, but it was a, a great transition, and I was lucky to end up with a great company. Betty, you mentioned um, branding. How important is that in cable? Um, obviously, it's very important. But also, I mean, you and Lisa are part of two of a handful of networks that are targeting women. How do you, how important is it to differentiate yourselves from each other and from we? Um, and is, is any of what, you know, is any of your branding a reaction to the other person's branding? And, and is, you know, is there a potential to grow your audience given, in, in any cable, um, with any cable network, given that you are very specific and niche um, outlets? Let's talk about five questions in Sorry. one. Let me try and address a couple of them. One is that actually I, I don't view women as a niche. They're half the population. So, the, so it's actually um, not a small group of people and there's actually always room to grow your audience. Um, and I, it's funny because Lifetime, when you think about your brand, you, first of all, I believe, number one, that they remain extremely important. I know that there's always, there will always be these debates when you work in a TV, particularly at a cable network and also at a broadcast network, but people will sometimes say, I don't think people are showing up to Lifetime or Oxygen for the brand. They come to shows, and there's always this big debate over, are people, do they watch brands or do they watch shows? And the answer is yes. I mean, you, you do have to have shows that pull people in, and they should be consistent with what people think you stand for. But I think in this age of uh, explosion of, and proliferation of media choices, and the appearance of things not just on the TV set but on your mobile phone and on the internet that brands are going to matter more not less that um, you know what, whatever it is that people think Lifetime stands for and I'll get to that in a second um, you know has to now translate not just on the TV screen but on all lots of different platforms and the way in which uh, brands now are things whether it's a TV brand or whether it's a brand of clothing or a brand of anything um, in a world of like huge amount of choice, brands are almost like how people navigate. And it's like I can't think of a particular thing, but I know the name such and such. Um, so brands are, are really important in that regard. As far as how Lifetime competes, um, we're actually in, a, in an interesting place because um, my bigger competitive set, Lifetime, actually plays in the general entertainment network sphere and in the women's sphere. So I think not just about Oxygen, but about TNT USA and Nick at Night because they're, they're sort of where Lifetime plays. We're, we're all 90 million home networks. We're all competing to, with uh, fairly high ratings and a, probably a whole other business model in, in terms of level of investment in uh, original programming, there are a mix of programming and things like that. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, I view Oxygen's brand as actually kind of more, definitely going after um, more of a younger woman's audience, whereas Lifetime has to be, um, our, our core audience is, it's both a demographic and a psychographic. You know, a lot of our viewers are 40 plus, and I also have to mention that when you, do run, when you run a TV network, you think about the audience and you also think about uh, the business side where your advertising dollars are going to come from. And there's, uh, there's these crazy breaks that might not mean, be meaningful to you, but Nielsen measures things, uh, the Nielsen rating service, there's 18 to 34s, and then there's 18 to 49s, and then there's 25 to 54s. And TV networks tend to build their businesses around some, either one or combination of those different demo breaks. And Lifetime's business is a combination of eight, definitely 18 to 49 and also 25 to 54. So we think about, you know, my, my sort of bullseye is a woman who's somewhere between 30 and 49. But in order to do that, TV's not an exact science. 
And so um, I'm not, I, I would love, I go after 18 to 34 is with some of our programming, um, but we're really, we're kind of more, I would say, main, mainstream, more mass appeal than I think oxygen's trying to be. And um, I can't say that we're trying to be who we are in reaction to oxygen or we, we certainly pay attention to what they're doing. But I also am looking at sort of how do I compete with TNT and USA and increasingly ABC and other networks. There are a lot of networks right now going after women, even though they're not actually um, positioning themselves in the women's category. So I actually view my true competition as probably any, any you know, I look a lot at just um, who, are all our, who all are going after women in the sort of 25 to 49 uh, age category. And that's sort of how we define our competition. Marketing to general management, which is overseeing marketing to programming, to what I'm doing now. But um, you know, in terms of career history, I come. Some some people will come out of sales, some will come out of programming, and I came out of marketing and promotion. Some come out of uh, law practices, <laughs> uh, which is not exactly the most direct route. I had uh, I was practicing law, getting kind of good at it after 15 years. And um, my now partner at Oxygen, Jerry Layborn. You have to define yourself in some way as an idea that's bigger than the sum of your parts or your individual shows because you just, just the sheer fragmentation aspect of it. And so I, uh, I think in cable it was very valuable, considered very valuable to understand both on your promotion, which are the coming attractions and the logos and all that sort of stuff, to then how you market not just individual shows but the entire network. And that tends to often drive what sort of programming you're after because you're thinking about what sort of audience you're after. And so I went from Mark literally 20 years later. And um, it's a very different lifetime, but the, uh, I guess my history really is more, uh, particularly with cable networks, and we're all, you know, we're all from cable, and I know you're going to get into brand things, but cable networks have to think about themselves, always did, uh, differently from broadcast networks because the moment you're on a, 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 a cable box with not four other choices, but 60 and then 100, and now today it's probably 300 if you have a digital cable box, you have ranks of on-air promotion and marketing. Uh, I started out in an ad agency and then I did on-air promotion, oddly enough, for the earliest days of Lifetime, which <laughs> was grew out in 1983 out of a merger of a health network and a women's afternoon channel. And I was at the health network. And so uh, it became Lifetime and I worked there for a little while and then left and um, went to Nickelodeon and then Turner mm -hmm. to launch TNT and then launch the Cartoon Network and then back to Lifetime almost well, I guess um, I'd like to begin with just how all of you came to be programming some of the most popular networks in cable, briefly. <laughs> okay, so we could start with Betty. How? Yeah, um, how did you, you know, come to be what you're doing now? And Oh, well, I guess um, rather than spend the whole night on <laughs> all of our resumes, um, I came up through the 